Norris, Laurie and I go back, I think about 25 years, which mm -hmm. is yes. awesome <laughs> when you think of it. Laurie is a writer of historical fiction and nonfiction, and she has a particular interest in the stories of women in 19th century Nova Scotia. She has authored three books, Cumberland County Facts and Folklore, Haunted Girl, the story of Esther Clark, excuse me, Esther Cox and the Great Amherst Mystery. And that's an enduring item of interest in our provincial history. And her third book is Found Drowned, which came out in 2019, her first novel. I read it, I enjoyed it immensely. For her background, Lori holds an MA in History and Art from the University of Victoria. She's worked in the heritage and cultural field for over 25 years and is currently employed at the Joggins Fossil Institute. She lives in River Herbert, excuse me, River Hibbert, right next door to Joggins <laughs> with her husband, Barry Norris, their cat, Dinah, and lots of books. Yes. <laughs> so she's currently transcribing and editing a book of letters with the working title, Paper Remains, The Life of a Nova Scotia Family in Documents. And I am assuming, Laurie, that this is the larger work from which you're drawing the presentation this evening. That's right, Lois, yes. I thought. Everyone is at home at a Methodist minister's house. And these are two of the Seaman daughters, Mary Seaman and Jenny Seaman. And Laurie is going to introduce us to her letter, to their letters. So Laurie, over to you. Good evening, everyone. And thank you, Lois, for that very kind introduction. And it's nice to see you again and, uh, and talk to you for a bit. And I'd like to thank everyone who was here this evening to hear my presentation. And I'd like to have the next slide, please. Now, Mary Seaman in Windsor, Nova Scotia, wrote to her mother, Frances, in Minuti on February 17th, 1881. And this is what she said. I expected to set right down after tea so as to be able to write you a good long letter. But of course, company came and I had been bothered the whole evening until it is now bedtime. Of all places on earth, I think this succeeds for company and callers and people coming from everywhere, entire strangers, because as they say, everyone is at home at a Methodist minister's house. Sometime it does put us out so dreadfully that we nearly all get sick. Now, Mary places the phrase, everyone is at home, etc., in quotation marks, indicating that she is referencing another, perhaps well-known source, while the context of her letter specifies that she is in fact living in a house where everyone but the minister's family feels at home. Mary wrote many letters, bemoaning her life as a minister's wife, a housekeeper, and a mother of eight children. Whenever Mary and her younger sister Jenny lived at a distance from their Minuti birthplace, they wrote almost weekly to at least one family member. This presentation examines letters, through letters, the married lives of Mary and Jenny Seaman, both wives of Methodist ministers in late 19th century Nova Scotia, and how the two endeavored to maintain relationships by their correspondence while coming to terms with their understanding of what it meant to be a wife, and in particular, the wife of a minister, Methodist minister. Next. Mary's missive of complaint is just one of approximately 4,000 letters found in the Amos Thomas Seaman House in Minuti. The house was built uh, for Amos Thomas Seaman, uh, the gentleman on the right upper screen. Uh, Amos Thomas was the eldest son of grindstone entrepreneur and merchant Amos King Seaman and his wife Jane Medcalf Seaman. The Minuti Heritage Association was bequeathed the house by Ruth Symes, a great granddaughter of Amos King Seaman and Jane Seaman in 2015. 
the letters date approximately from the 1830s down uh, to 2012. And all the letters and photos, um, unless otherwise stated uh, this evening, are from the Minuti Heritage Association collection. Next. Now, where have these letters been all this time in the house? They were located, most of them, on the ground floor of the house in a dining room closet. And the greatest majority of the letters were in uh, this carrying satchel and this wooden chest. Uh, they were in bundles, uh, 40 to 50 letters. And each bundle was tied with a ribbon or a string or an elastic. There were other letters within the whole house. I don't think there was one room in which at least one letter uh, was not found. Um, sometimes there was just one letter by itself. Uh, sometimes there was letters stuffed into plastic bags, in paper bags, in desk drawers, in uh, dresser drawers. Uh, they were really scattered throughout the house. Uh, but the only ones that were, I would say, curated by the Seaman family were found in this uh, satchel and in this wooden chest. Next slide. I wanted to show you a bit of uh, just a sample of some of the letters that I have found and, and some of my favorites and what I found interesting. Um, letters that were written um, in sympathy uh, to a family that was mourning or by a family that was mourning was usually bordered uh, with a black line and the uh, envelope as well would be bordered with a black line to indicate that either the sender or the giver uh, was, uh, was in mourning. What you see here is what they call cross writing. And uh, what happens is that uh, most of the letters that I found um, were on a piece of paper, about uh, eight and a half by 11, folded horizontally, and then written on each as a separate piece of paper, like four pieces of paper. So a person would write their letter. We see here, it says Minuti, October 1st, and down here, my dear Jenny, and then the person writes the letter and finishes all four sides. And then the time comes, there's no more paper, but she still wants, she still has news to tell. So they simply would turn the letter on a vertical and continue here. This says, I took Aunt Patty down to Lower Cove this afternoon. Um, really, it looks kind of complicated, but it's really quite easy to read once you get the hang of the handwriting. So it's quite an ingenious way to, uh, to write a letter and save paper at the same time. Over here, you see uh, detail from uh, a, a piece of stationery uh, that a young girl in Massachusetts had written to uh, young Emma Seema when they were, Amy Seaman, when they were about um, 12 years old. And it contains a nursery rhyme. She says here, she cut off their tails with a carving knife. And here you see uh, the farmer's wife with uh, the ominous looking knife right here. And here are the three little mousies that are about to get their tails cut off. And this was the, the type of, um, of stationery that was considered um, okay for a, a young child at that time. Perhaps uh, my favorite thing that I found so far in the letters uh, was a drawing. Uh, it is uh, part of a letter that was written to Jenny Seaman by a classmate at uh, the Mount Allison Ladies College. And she is um, teasing Jenny about her beau, Rudman Allen. And Rudman Allen was a student at the Mount Allison Academy. And uh, the friend has drawn a picture. Here is Rudman with his top hat and his, his uh, long coat. And there is Jenny uh, facing him. And she is, I'm assuming, all dressed up uh, in her finery. And then the friend has written below, this is Rodman, this is Rod, this is Rod running to meet Jenny. He is saying, oh, Jenny, dear, I love you dearly. So this is, I think, one of my favorite images. And it really is um, kind of a very personal indication of uh, young girls having fun and teasing each other about their bows. Next slide. Now, as uh, Lois mentioned a few minutes ago, 
Um, this presentation is a portion of a book in process uh, that I'm writing of, of transcribed letters whose working title, I change the working title every once in a while. The working title right now is Paper Remains, the Documented Life and Times of a Nova Scotia Family. And what I'm attempting to do here is using the, the semen letters, using uh, diaries and journals that some of the semen family kept, some of which uh, have been found in the house, and newspapers from the time period. I'm planning to look at anything that was written by the Seaman family or written about the Seaman family in newspapers uh, during the late, uh, you know, the later half of the 18th century. And working together with these three provide a documented and annotated history of the Nova Scotia family. And the this uh, presentation about the Methodist minister's wives is going to be hopefully a chapter in that book. So that's what that's what I'm working on. Next slide. Now the name Minuti was likely an Acadian corruption of the Mi'kmaq word Muntek, meaning at the sack, referring to the geographical formation of the Minuti Marsh. It was for thousands of years a place of Mi'kmaq habitation and fishing. In the late 1600s, Acadians built dikes and abattoir and began farming in the area. And of course, in 1755, uh, Minuti was one of the many Acadian villages which experienced the deportation. In the 1870s and 1880s, when Mary and Jenny were writing the majority of their letters, Minuti had a population of approximately 600 and was an active farming, fishing, and lumbering community. It was, however, past its early 19th century economic heyday. The community, along with the Seaman family fortune, went into decline just before and definitely after the death of King Seaman in 1864. Next slide. Now, Gilbert Seaman, was another of uh, King Seaman's and Jane Seaman's sons. Uh, he, it's, he's here on the right. In the middle of the screen is his wife, Frances. Next to Frances is Gilbert Seaman's younger sister, Jane. And it was through Jane that Gilbert and Frances met each other. They married in 1851. And in September of 1877, uh, more than 20 years after uh, their marriage, they moved into the house, the Amos Thomas Seaman house. And throughout his life, Gilbert was engaged in the family business of grindstone manufacturing, shipping, ex exporting, and manufacturing. Now, the majority of the letters that have been found in the house were written from, to, and among Gilbert, Francis, and their six children. Uh, may I have the next slide? And these are the children. Um, Mary, the eldest, who, whose letters we're looking at tonight. Roland, whose um, nickname was Toss. Frank, Jenny, who again, we're looking at her this evening. William and Emma. Emma was the baby of the family. And Emma was the mother of uh, Ruth Symes, who eventually bequeathed the house to the Minuti Heritage Association. Now, all of the children lived, uh, all of these children lived to adulthood. Some of them only uh, lived to early adulthood. They're, they were all given a, a very good education uh, outside of the county. Uh, the girls all attended uh, Mount Allison Ladies College. Uh, Frank and Roland and William all attended uh, either uh, Mount Allison Academy or later Mount Allison University. Uh, Roland uh, attended um, the Windsor Academy and Mary went to at least one private girls school in St. John. Next, please. Now the Siemens were both Methodists and they were community leaders. In fact, they were one of the leading families in the county and the province during the lifetime of Amos Siemens Sr. He donated land and money to build a universalist church. And this church was to be used by a number of different Protestant denominations, Baptist, Anglican, Presbyterian, etc. And clergymen from all Protestant faiths were engaged 
to come to Minuti and preside over meetings and services. And so we're frequently visiting Minuti. And many of these young single men, uh, Methodists overall, there was more Methodist ministers coming to Minuti than any other, but there were many um, other denominations as well. Uh, many were young single men, usually required to remain a few days in Minuti. Uh, the majority of them would stay overnight uh, in Minuti in the home of Gilbert and Francis, and they would uh, get to know the community and family very well. Next, please. Now, the Nova Scotia Methodist Conference, like an association, was formed in 1874. And the province was broken up into six districts, one of which was Cumberland. And in these districts in the province, there were a total of 77 circuits. And each circuit contained a number of communities which would be guaranteed visits, weather and health permitting by assigned Methodist clergy. And most of the persons would, at least one of them would have a home base within a circuit. And, uh, that would last maybe about three years and they would be then they would likely be re relocated to another circuit within the province or even within the Atlantic provinces. And there were many visiting persons as well, uh, a lot of them younger men who perhaps were just beginning their career and getting to learn the ropes or older men who were coming in to uh, um, give special sermons or meetings, that type of thing. Uh, next slide, please. Now these young churchmen were considered uh, by many in Minuti, Barentsfield, River Hibbert and surrounding area as potential marriage partners. And Mary was at school in St. John when her cousin Ella Hibbert wrote to her in April of 1872. And this is what Ella said. Ah, Mary, you lost your chance. Mr. McIntosh is really going to be married this summer. Mr. John Thompson is coming to Minuti soon and Mr. Pike, a witter man, as Sylvie says, is to preach here this summer. That will be number two for you. I met him up at your father's. He is very good looking and young. So don't leave your heart in St. John. Ella's teaching would prove prophetic for Mary. Next, please. Um, John, uh, the Mr. Pike that Ella was speaking of was John Martin Pike who was originally from Newfoundland where he was educated and worked as a pastor in a number of outposts and came to Cumberland. He was in Cumberland County at least since uh, 1869 and he was a pastor in Napan. His first wife, Ellen Pugsley, uh, was from Napan and she unfortunately died in 1871, leaving John and Morley uh, alone and Morley was a four month old son. A year later, in 1872, John is transferred to the River Hibbert Circuit, which included Minuti, and it's there where he and Mary met. Now, there's no courting le letters found, as yet found between Mary and John. It might be that since John was in the community, they didn't need to write to each other. It may be that they never existed or uh, they had been destroyed. Uh, whatever. Uh, happened. John and Mary were married on July the 8th, 1874. And uh, next slide, please. Now, the Seaman family did not approve of the match. Days before the, the wedding, uh, Gilbert writes to um, Mary's brother, Frank, I don't make any inquiries about it. It is still just as disagreeable to me as ever, but it is put down for the eighth or ninth instant. The folks at the house are preparing as it seems a certain fact and we all must put up with it. And Francis wrote to Frank after the wedding. We feel very blue and lonely since Mary left us. I hope the next marriage in our family may be more agreeable to, to us for this one has almost broken our hearts. Now this approval voiced by Gilbert and Francis seems to have been a common tread uh, among Methodist parents. Marilyn Whiteley in her book, Canadian Methodist Women says that quote, many parents were far from pleased to learn that their daughters wished to marry a Methodist preacher. Some no doubt hoped that the young women would contract more fashionable marriages with men of higher status 
and more favorable financial prospects, unquote. Next slide. Nonetheless, as I said, uh, John and Mary did marry and John, uh, they left. Uh, John was relocated down into the Yarmouth circuit and uh, became a pastor of the Arcadian Methodist Church. Next, uh, next slide. And Mary writes to her mother about um, life, um, life in her new home. I found the house nicely fitted up with everything to make it comfortable. It is newly papered and painted throughout with nice furniture and everything clean and neat about it. The pantry shelves are loaded with all kinds of cakes, pies, bread, biscuits, and preserves, enough to last for a long time yet. Everything is in readiness to commence housekeeping. And it's here where Mary first encounters in Arcadia those pesky callers who, was all, who were always knocking at her door. She says, my dear Ma, there has been callers constantly ever since I came, morning, afternoon, and evening. Sometime I wish them further apart. Next. Now, as a minister's wife, Mary was obligated to be a caller herself, returning all the visits that were made to her home and attending social functions hosted by both secular and church organizations, and not, not only those by the Methodist Church, but all other Protestant denominations in the area. And here she tells us a bit about them. Uh, she tells uh, Frances that she went to the Sewing Society for the first time. The ladies appear to enjoy themselves exceedingly, but I thought it rather dull. I had a black and white stocking assigned to me and I knit so steadily that when I got home, I was as tired as though I had worked hard all day. Uh, she writes Toss that she went to the Baptist meeting last evening in Arcadia. The church is a pretty neat looking building and the music is good, but I don't care much for the preaching. And also she attended a tea meeting at the Episcopal church yesterday and they all had a very nice time. Next. Now, like many women in her class, Mary relied on the help of servants to assist with their housework and childcare. This help was often hard to secure and letters between Mary, her mother and their friends are often filled with the problems related to getting and keeping a girl. Many a letter they talk about, do you have a girl yet? I lost my girl last week. My girl didn't stay very long. My girl's not working out, that type of thing. The letters are filled with um, um, comments about the relationship that these women were having with uh, their servants in uh, servants or maids who, who, who these girls were. So anyway, Mary tells Frances that I expect a girl next Monday. I hope she will be a good one. It is hard having company and performing the part of housemaid at the same time. Next slide. Now the annual Methodist conference, um, like an AGM, was a major occurrence in the business year of the Methodist church. Besides the many lectures and business meetings held, it was also the time when ministers and their families discovered if they would be staying in the same community or circuit uh, for another year or removing to another church. So Mary is telling her mother, I have received a, a unanimous invitation to remain here another year but there is no certainty about it. I would just as well remove. I think I would like to change every year and try all the different places. We have not much to carry about except our clothing and it would not be very much trouble. I would like to see the different parts of the province and get acquainted with people. And one part of, of this letter uh, Mary wrote came as a surprise to me. She wrote, I have never mentioned to you before that I have become a Christian for fear that you would make fun of it at home, but I cannot help it. I am now determined to be a Christian in every sense of the word if such a thing is possible. Now the Seaman family on a whole did not often discuss their religious faith in their letters beyond the usual parental reminder to attend church and meeting and the child's reassurance that they had. Mary's transcribed letters up to this point uh, besides the one I've quoted here, do not discuss faith. She, like the rest of her family, referred to it in times of mourning when expressing sympathy or grief to a family member or friend. Next. 
But three months later in July, Mary did get her wish to be relocated. And although only to nearby Yarmouth, she was again homesick. And she tells her mom, my dear mom, we moved over to town Friday. The house is comfortably fitted up and has more convenience than the one we left. But still I was sorry to leave Arcadia and its good kind people and have felt homesick ever since we came and cannot stop crying whenever Arcadia is mentioned. Now the people who would have fitted up Mary's home as she mentions here would be Methodist church women, uh, likely members of ladies aid societies uh, which were forming uh, without, within uh, the Methodist church community across Canada in the mid to late 1900s. And these were the same women who would put on the teas, who would um, organize the bazaars and any fundraising events and the sewing circles. Next. And uh, this is the Providence Methodist Church that would have been the church uh, John Pike was pastor of. It was built in 1860 and unfortunately uh, burned in a uh, fire in uh, 1921. Next, next slide. Next slide. Thank you. Um, now Mary sometimes compared her situation unfavorably with the more well-to-do of Yarma society. And here she discussed a recent visit to neighbors. They are very kind people, have a lovely home and everything lovely in it. I think theirs is the most tasteful and most perfect home I have yet seen in Yarmouth. When I return to the parsonage, everything looks desolate and forsaken. After seeing such grand houses filled with so much that is handsome and attractive, I think I feel better satisfied when I remain at home. Next slide. Now, later that year, Mary wanted her mother to come for a visit, and she discussed her first experience of childbirth. Uh, in October of 1876, she gave birth to her first child, Roland Seaman Pike, and remember, she, she, uh, she has a stepson, a young stepson, Morley, uh, who was John's from John's first marriage, and now they have Roland. And she says to her mother, I've been trying to hurry you to make your visit before I get sick for it would be anything but pleasant. You would perhaps be uneasy and I would rather have you in ignorance than to worry about me. Next slide. Now, almost three years later in 1879, John was again given uh, the River Hibbert circuit. And in two letters to Frank, Jenny writes about about the success uh, he's having in the community. She says, Mr. Pike has lots of meetings, a Sunday school Sabbath meeting, preaching in the afternoon and prayer meeting in the evening, then Monday evening class meeting and Wednesday prayer meeting. In becoming a member of the Monday class, they pledge themselves solemnly to abstain from drinking, swearing, dancing, card playing, getting into debt, going to law, et cetera, et cetera. So you may expect the lamb and the lion to lie down together and be in peace. So um, Reverend Pike was obviously doing uh, a, great, uh, a great job in the community. Next. Now, while in Minuti, Mary and John's family grows again. On June 13th, 1879, she gave birth this time to twins, Bessie Hall and Gilbert George. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to find um, a uh, picture of uh, little Gilbert as a baby, but, but this, is, uh, this is Bessie. Uh, next slide. Uh, and despite their success in Minuti, by the year's end, by the end of 1879, uh, Mary and John uh, know that they will be soon on the move once again. And in July of the next year, she writes her mother and it's Windsor, uh, Nova Scotia, uh, to which they've been relocated. She says, we were greeted by at the parsonage by a few ladies who had prepared a meal for us. They soon kindly took their departure and we were glad to be left to ourselves. I do not think it as pretty as a garment, but Mr. Pike says there is no comparison. Windsor is so much prettier. Next picture. and Mary's pregnant again. Uh, in April of 1881, she gives birth to John Arthur Stanley. And this time, 
Frances, her mother, is in Windsor uh, to be with her. And Frances tells her husband, my dear Gib, I am here yet waiting patiently for Mary to get through her troubles. Since I have stayed so long, I can't bear to leave till this affair is over. The children are all very well now. Mr. Pike is better, but is still unable to preach. Next. Now, John's illness, which Francis refers to uh, in the letter, appears to have begun when he was stationed in Minuti for the second time. Continuous coughs, colds, and breathing problems caused the family's relocation to Windsor to be a short one. By July 1882, the Pike family had left Windsor. Mary and the five children traveled to Minuti while John goes on to Halifax to start work at the office at the Wesleyan, the Methodist newspaper for the Atlantic provinces. Uh, after which they're going to travel to no no South Carolina and their new home. At the beginning of November, Mary reluctantly makes her way to Halifax where she and her family will spend their final few weeks in a boarding house. The Pike family left Halifax sometime after November 13th and arrived in Somerville, South Carolina on December 10th, 1882. And I will now read the letter, excerpt from the letters which I was supposed to read before I read that. Uh, so while they're still in Windsor, uh, Francis tells Gilbert, Mr. Pike has been miserable and unable to pe preach for a couple of months. The doctors told him he had consumption and his only chance would be to go to a warm climate. He then made up his mind to leave Windsor. She reassures Frank the next uh, month, however, that Mary is very com comfortably situated in Windsor. They have a nice house on the best street, the church is close by, and the congregation is as large and respectable as you see in the Halifax or St. John churches. If it were not for the hardship of having so many babies, I think she is better off than any of us. Next. So, um, they're, uh, so they're relocating, uh, they're leaving Nova Scotia, they're going off to South Carolina. While Mary is still in Halifax, she writes to her father in response to a letter uh, that he wrote to her. And he, she says, Dear Pa, your letter was received Friday evening. After reading it, I settled myself down to a great crying spell. It nearly kills me to have you say that we may never meet again. If either of us is removed from life ere we meet again, I sincerely hope it will be myself. But if my life is spared, I am sure that my aim and object will be to return for a visit to see you all again, and that before very long, perhaps in two years. And I think that um, this letter is a good example of um, the threat of con that the threat of constant relocation and the heartache it sometimes caused may have been another reason for a family to disapprove of their daughter's marriage to a Methodist minister. Next. Now, John and Mary spent the rest of their days in the United States, living in uh, both South Carolina and Florida, and infrequently visiting Nova Scotia. Mary gave birth to three more children and was predeceased in 1906 by her eldest son, Roland, and her eldest daughter, Bessie. Mary died in October of 1923, followed by John, who died in May of 1932. And the pho photograph that you see here uh, was found in the house. And um, on the back of the photograph, it states that it's the Pike family. I'm not 100% sure who everybody here is. I'm assuming that the woman on the far right is Mary and the gentleman on the far left uh, with, the, with the small child is Reverend Pike. Now, John and Mary uh, had eight children and had seven children in total. Uh, there's eight children here, so I'm not exactly sure who uh, one of them is. And the older woman in the center of uh, the photograph, I'm not sure who she is as well. Uh, this photograph was taken in Florida. So uh, we're going to leave Mary now in Somerville, and we're going to turn our attention over to Jenny. Next slide. This is Jenny and Thomas, and Jenny attended St. Um, Mount Allison Ladies College 
uh, in the late 1870s. She often visited Mary in Yarmouth, Windsor and Somerville, usually during Mary's pregnancies or um, after one of the children were born. Jenny received and wrote many letters to a number of admirers, including Redmond Allen, a student at the Mount Allison Academy who we saw earlier in cartoon form, uh, Reverend Robert Hudgel, an itinerant Methodist minister, and another minister, Reverend Thomas Wooten, the man who became her husband. Now, Thomas was born in 1860 and raised in London, England. He studied uh, for the church there and immigrated to Nova Scotia sometime before or in early 1883, which was the year he was given the River Hibbert Circuit. Next slide. Now, three years later, in 1886, Jenny is away from Minuti on an extended visit to Mary in the States and stays there over six months. And when she, while she is there, her father Gilbert writes to her um, and his letter contains news of Thomas who to Gilbert's mind isn't doing all that well in Minuti. And he says, we have had no services this day, but I believe Mr. Wooten holds forth this eve. I do not attend his services, he has about used up Methodism in this place and I am told is not well liked at the River Hibbert. Now, it's not known when the romantic relationship between Jenny and Thomas began, but it seems that while she was in South Carolina, they did exchange letters and gifts, uh, gifts over the Christmas season. In an undated letter written after Jenny's return to Minuti, Thomas tells her that he felt she must have loved him for a while because you accepted my poor presence when I thought you knew they were tokens of love. And so now through all my blundering and the most determined of our mistaken friends, we have left the desert of uncertain wandering and are in the place of perfect rest and confidence in each other. The fiercer the storm, the sweeter the rest. We prove this, don't we, my dear? And this letter also contains what right now is my famous, fa my favorite quote in the whole collection. And uh, so he tells her, I think you should read more books and work less. I'm afraid, dear, I shall not very soon get over the discovery I made on Wednesday that my angel had been carrying in wood. Oh, darling, do take it easy and let others work. I think that's a great insight to uh, their relationship and uh, to Thomas's personality. Next. Now, um, their relationship, however, seems to have been no more welcomed by the Seaman family than was John and Mary's 12 years before. After what may have been a confrontation between uh, her parents and Jenny and Thomas, she writes to him, I cannot live under the present arrangement. You must not try to talk to my present, only write. And please do not come again to Minuti. When you next come, I shall go with you. Oh, I am so tired of everything, almost of living. I do not see how I can ever be married at home. And if no one objects, I shall meet you someplace else. Uh, next. Now, to get a little bit of advice, Jenny writes to her sister, Mary. And on August 27th, 1887, uh, Mary writes back to Jenny and in this excerpt, she expresses herself candidly on her disappointment in her own life as a minister's wife and what Jenny may face in the future. And Mary says, I do not think you will get anyone any better than Thomas. His character is as far as you know without blemish, but he is a minister and that seems to be a disgrace in your part of the world. You are leaving a splendid home where there is plenty of everything. Parsonages are poorly and scarcely provided for. Methodist ministers are poor, there is no mistake about it. And they never get any better off, but grow poorer and poorer every year. And the life of a mem mem Methodist minister's wife is not all sunshine. It is toilsome, straight-laced, all denying. Next. Now by July of 1888, Thomas has moved away from Minuti. Uh, he's been relocated to Wentworth in Cumberland County to become the parson of the Methodist Church there. 
And according to Jenny's undated letter to him below, the couple seemed to be still courting in secret. Uh, they're planning a visit, him to come to Minuti, and she says, I can meet you someplace. If you should call, someone might be here. Then I couldn't leave, but I can plan for a walk in the evening, down to the cemetery, round the back road, whatever, whenever you suggest, only let me know. P.S. If we do not meet this Wednesday evening, drive down Thursday afternoon early, and if I am not at the window door or gate, shall be walking toward the back road. Next slide. Now, whatever the Seaman family's problems uh, with the relationship, Jenny and Thomas did in fact marry on October 30th, 1888. And Jenny writes uh, to her mother after a honeymoon in Halifax and the Annapolis Valley, her and um, Thomas settled down in Wentworth. And she says, at 11 a.m. we reached Wentworth. It is a strange looking place at this season. Nature has done more for it than art. The houses, churches, and other buildings were certainly not built for show and seemed at first sight all the more shabby in contrast with what we have seen in Annapolis. The scenery though is beautiful. When you drive through uh, the Wentworth Valley today along the secondary highway, you will see uh, United Church Cemetery up on a hillside. Uh, in that cemetery, there's a, a memorial cairn. Uh, there is uh, perhaps a, a reproduction of a painting that was made at one time of what the first uh, Methodist church in Wentworth looked like. It was built before 1838 and would have been the church that Thomas uh, preached in. And below the painting is a cairn, is a a uh, monument stone that indicates it is now a provincial historic site. Uh, next slide, please. And like, uh, and Jenny talks about her attempts at housekeeping as a, as a new housewife in Wentworth. She said, I shall tell you all about our housekeeping. Do not see, however, how I can get on without your good judgment and advice. I shall feel entirely helpless and lost for a while until I learn to paddle my own canoe. And Jenny also informs Frances that like her sister, she has after marriage became a member of the church. And she says, I was baptized and received into the church on Tuesday last at New Annan. This I hope will strengthen and help us to live a better life. My only regret aside from the deep feelings of my own unworthiness, was that I had put it off for so long. Next. And the day after her first wedding anniversary on October 31st, 1889, Jenny is readying her house for company. She tells Frances, I want to get the windows all washed before the sewing circle. Her and Thomas hosted the sewing circle at their home and also hosted uh, choir practice would be at their home. So for the next year, Thomas and Jenny thrived in Wentworth. They enjoyed their home, tended their vegetable garden, raised chickens, led church services, called and had callers. And Jenny, unlike Mary, was able, uh, because of uh, the shorter distance, to visit Minuti and her mother regularly. Okay, next slide. Now, on October 5th, 1890, a letter from William uh, who was attending medical school in Philadelphia, written to his mother, Frances, is the first indication I found so far in the letters that Jenny is pregnant. Uh, William says, write me how Jenny gets along when that important event transpires. And she, in fact, travels to Minuti to be with her mother to have the baby. Next slide. And... Uh, Approximately 10 days later, Frank writes a hurried and likely hand-delivered note to his father, and he says, Dear Father, Dr. Ayer is here and despairs of Jenny's life almost. I sent Dennis, who is to call at Dr. Mitchell's, to ask him to come here at once. If Mitchell can't come, send Dr. Hewson to Amherst Point at once. Telegraphed E. T. F. Woten Wentworth to come and hurry home yourself. We are sad household. Yours, Frank. Jenny died on October the 15th from what the Signecto Post later described as convulsions. 
her baby girl survived and was named Jenny Seaman. Little Jenny was born on October the 14th, so her mother expired some hours after her birth. The cause was likely encephalitis, uh, no, eclampsia, I'm sorry. The cause was likely eclampsia, a life-threatening condition that can occur during pregnancy or shortly after giving birth. It is considered a rare condition caused by high blood pressure and an abundance of protein in the urine. Its final stages are characterized by seizures, unconsciousness, and if untreated, death. Next slide. Now, um, shortly after the death, Mary, of course, gets news from the family and she writes to her mother and father and she says, Dear Pa, how shocked and grieved I was to read of the sudden death of my very dear sister. The blow comes so unexpectedly that it seems impossible for me, seems impossible for me to realize, seems like some ugly dream. My heart aches for you and Ma in your sorrow and loneliness. Won't you write me the particulars about Jenny? I never had any idea that she was in that way at all. She never mentioned it. If so, I never received the letter. Won't you please tell me what went wrong and tell me about the baby, poor little thing. I would like to get it if I could and take care of it for poor Jenny's sake. It nearly kills me to think that she is dead. Next slide. Now, Jenny Seaman Woten. Little Jenny lived with her father sporadically as a baby and a young child. Otherwise, she was raised by her grandparents, Francis and Gilbert, and lived for the rest of her life in the nudie. Thomas remarried a few years after Jenny's death. He eventually left the church and he and his second family moved back to England. In later years, he seems to have become estranged from his children, his second wife and his siblings. In the early 1900s, his second wife would often write to the Seaman family asking if they had seen him or knew of his whereabouts. At this time, I don't know the date of Thomas's death and the few letters he wrote to Minuti over the years indicate that he was never fully reconciled to Jenny's death. And the photo here on the right uh, was another one that was found in the house. At the top of the frame, it says the Walton family and I'm assuming uh, that the woman holding the baby is uh, Thomas's second wife and her two children. And the little girl sitting on the stool just under her, her, just under her photo is the name Jenny. I'm assuming that this is uh, little uh, Jenny Seaman Woten. And uh, the gentleman on the far right, I, I'm not sure at this time who he is. Next slide, please. Now, uh, Mary's and Jenny's letters as a whole, uh, Jenny's correspondence as a married woman is small in volume compared to Mary's, whose life and experiences span decades and an international border. And uh, it's really interesting uh, to see uh, the differences and the similarities be with Mary's experience in the United States um, and in Nova Scotia as a Methodist minister's wife. I see the letters as a very impressive primary source created by these two sisters who led parallel yet ultimately different lives. And I see it as really providing a great um, chronology or timeline of interact their interactions with their parents or siblings, their friends, their teachers, other people, etc. And I hope um, that the, these letters in particular were proved to be proved to be an important addition to existing sources of Canadian Methodist women's history. Um, Dr. Marilyn Whiteley and Dr. Hannah Lane, both of whom have written extensively about Canadian Methodist women, have drawn their information for the most part from newspapers, ob obituaries and diaries. Uh, they, they have seen a few letters, uh, not a lot, uh, and I'm hoping that Mary's and Jenny's letters will really um, add a whole other la layer of meaning and of knowledge about Methodist ministers' wives. And there's still many more letters to be uh, transcribed. I've got a long way to go. Uh, so there's still a lot more to learn. Next slide. I'd like to thank Dr. Hannah Lane uh, 
who sent me excellent reading material and suggested much more that I haven't got all gotten to. She introduced me to the work of Marilyn Whiteley, uh, which has and will be a great help to me in putting Mary and Jenny into historical context. My husband, Barry Norris, took photos and scanned all the images uh, that you've seen in this presentation. My friend, Barb Thompson, is a researcher extraordinaire, and she supplied me with the genealogical information on the Siemens. West Hans Historical Society and Yarmouth County Archives sent me information. I'd like to thank Shirley and um, I'd like to thank Shirley for considering my proposal for this presentation and the Royal Nova Scotia Historical Society for going along with it. And I'm really grateful and honored to be able to give this presentation this evening. And I'd also like to thank Sharon Gould and the Minuti Heritage Association for allowing me to play with these letters for the last four years. I consider myself very fortunate to be able to do so. Uh, so that is my presentation. And at this time, I would welcome uh, any questions or comments. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, uh, Lori. That's uh, really interesting. And I see people have already got their hands up, uh, lining up to ask you questions or to make comments. Good. Good. So, uh, <laughs> We'll, uh, we'll get started with those uh, people, but I also want to um, uh, just say to everyone that one of the things you said when you uh, told me why you were interested in speaking tonight is um, uh, that um, you were, this is Morgan Parkland, you're curious about um, themes that you might develop in the work yes. as it goes along. Yes. So, uh, it will be really valuable to uh, you, I understand, to hear about what people think that to see Definitely. developed more in the, uh, out Definitely. of what you said tonight. Definitely. So, and keep, uh, sorry, and keep in mind that this is, what you've seen here is just one chapter of what I'm planning to do because the, the letters cover a myriad of subjects and people and events and time periods. So this is just one uh, section of it. Right, so we won't blame you for not addressing a certain topic, but we will uh, express oh. our interest and curiosity <laughs> about other, other topics. Right. That's great. So um, now people who uh, used their icons earlier to uh, were apparently applauding because the hands have come up and gone oh. down. So oh, I, I didn't see that, thank you. <laughs> My intention for speaking. So just to people generally, I do have a question in mind. To people generally, uh, I'll be uh, fielding, um, uh, I'll be running the speakers list. And what I'll ask you to do is to get my attention by one of several ways. If you are someone who knows how to raise your hand in this software, you can do that. Uh, the easiest way might be to use, move your cursor over the uh, reaction icon and click on it like I'm doing now to uh, show a, a hand up, a raised hand. Um, but you can also just unmute your uh, icon or turn on your camera and that will show me that you're interested in uh, posing a question or making a comment. So. I don't know whether Jim, you were just, Morrison, you were just practicing or whether you have a question or a comment to make. I probably need a look at this, but I just, yeah, I didn't, I didn't have a question. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Please go ahead. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thanks very much, Lori. I, I really, I really appreciated that presentation. Um, Thank you. One of the things I wondered about was the religion within the Seaman family. Mm -hmm. um, because, of course, I mean, you mentioned the Universalist Church uh, very early on in your presentation, and King Seaman was very, very uh, prominent in terms of Universalist, later the Uni Universalist Church. Mm -hmm. And of course, they, they're they kind of two, three steps removed from considering them Christian. You have the Uni Unitarian Church in Halifax in the 1830s. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess I wondered if you can maybe not now, but maybe tease out that relationship, because you did say, I think, that Mary really becomes a Christian much later on, mm -hmm. <laughs> even after she's already married to a Methodist minister. Yes, yes. So that, that, kind of, that kind of interests me, and so it really yes. means 
what kind of influence does her home yeah. upbringing have on her religious faith? Well, um, I can say a couple of things here that uh, during the 1830s, I believe it was, King Seaman, I'll call him King Seaman, um, was in Maine and Massachusetts uh, on two different occasions when he heard a Universalist minister speak and became very interested in uh, the whole concept of Universalism. Right. And this is why he went back to Minuti mm -hmm. and thought, you know, and put the money forward and the land forward uh, to build the church with also the understanding that other every that all the Protestant religions were were invited to do that. Now, I don't in the letters, I don't have any real um, a lot of indication of universalism written about in the letters. Mm -hmm. As far as people mention Methodism, Gilbert talks about Methodist ministers and the Methodist religion. Gilbert never seems to call himself uh, a universalist. So I'm not sure, um, you know, if there was a break there, I'm not sure uh, how much Amos uh, Seaman influenced his children. Um, and uh, as far as Mary's concerned and becoming a Christian as an adult, um, I think, and I, I'm, I don't know a lot about the Methodist religion, but the little I've read, this seems to be something that was common where um, there was no set time period. It wasn't a rite of passage to become a part of the Methodist church at a certain time. Um, and um, for some reason, she felt inspired at that time uh, in her life to become a Christian. I was really um, interested in the fact that she thought her family would tease her about it. And I don't know if that is something that would be a common thing or it was just something peculiar to the Siemens. I'm not sure. Yeah, that's why I wondered if the whole universalist act aspect of it, you know, like you're talking about King, uh, you know, King Seaman in the 18, 1830s. I mean, right. 1837, you do right. have a universalist church uh, and, and one here in Halifax too. Yes. Um, yes. But I mean, I, is that why the tension is there, I guess, and why they're critical of the fact that she is uh, declaring perhaps, to be Christian now? Perhaps that's, and you know what, that's a very good, uh, that's a very good point for me to explore mm -hmm. because um, as far as I'm aware, the letters that I've seen so far, universalism does not seem to be um, talked about or an issue. Um, so it's definitely something that I have to learn more about. And the relationship, there was a lot of tension um, later on in King Seaman's life with Gilbert in particular, having to do with uh, the grindstone industry and having to do with the family business. And maybe there was, uh, so, and uh, Gilbert, as well as a couple of other brothers, uh, they were estranged from their father toward the end, and uh, some of them, they weren't speaking. Right. Maybe that had something to do with it, but that's something, uh, the religious aspect of the whole thing, that's something I, I do need to explore. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, this religious uh, aspect will likely end up being a whole other chapter, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There is a historian who's done a, a book on the... Um, as they, as they call it now, the UU. Okay. Uh, uh, her name is Heather Watts. Heather Watts. She lives here in Halifax, but if, you know, if we-, we The name's track, familiar. Yeah, possibly, yeah, because she did write a book on the on the UU church. Okay. So, I mean, if we can email back and forth, then I can, I can give you more information. Sure. And I mean, I can at some point now or later on give people my email, mm -hmm. I guess. Shirley, can I do that now? Yes, uh, sorry, I was uh, dealing with um, uh, a, a question in the in the uh, chat section. Um, okay. But yes, your email. Um, it is- uh, It's not, is it- uh, Pardon me? I remember your email. It's a very tricky one because it has three ends in it. Three ends, yes. Uh, it's Glenn Norris, G-L-E-N-N, -N, N-O-R-R-I-S 
at bellalliant.net. Right. Oh, thank you, Sarah. Great. Sarah has shown it. Uh, um, Sarah has spelled it out here, which is good. And I do welcome- In wel the uh, comments uh, section. Yeah. I do welcome Great. any okay. comments and questions. Next. Okay, so now the floor is to Glenna or Sharon. Uh, sorry, I'm still confused, but the floor <laughs> is yours. Hi, Sharon. Hi there, hello everyone. If I may speak to Mr. Morrison's comments there, um, Heather Watts was an active member of the committee that operates the Universalist Church uh, for many years. I'm not sure if she's still on the committee, but I know she's been active there. And um, the Universalist Church, from my readings, was a break off of the Southern Baptist Church and I don't know the dates, but back in numerous years. And the leader became Jose Ballou. And we found a large uh, photograph of Mr. Ballou in the Gilbert Siemens house that mm. the Minuti Heritage uh, inherited, the Amos Thomas Seaman house it's known as. Mm -hmm. And it, this photo now hangs in the Universalist Church in Minuti. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is open to the public every year. Uh, they have just formed new committee there and with new blood and new excitement in their mission. And um, in Gilbert Seaman's diary for a period of four or five years, he regularly lists Sunday by Sunday, the clergyman and the uh, religion that he uh, preached with as coming to Minuti to be the speaker in the afternoon or the evening. And uh, it, it, there's a really good uh, record of the um, ministers and when they were speaking. And neighboring Minuti, high on a hill, is the little community of Bairnsfield. And Bairnsfield is on a land grant given after the um, defeat at the Plains of, uh, Plains of Abraham, Colonel Edward Barron, uh, who fought with Wolf, uh, received a thousand acres of land and he became very well known and involved. And Gilbert Seaman writes in his diary that Edward Barron would go in his yard and blow his horn so the people in the communities could hear it and that signal to one and all that a clergyman would be preaching at the Universalist Church that Sunday. That was their method of communication. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> oh, Shirley, you're off uh, there. Yes, I'm back on. I see uh, John Reed has his hand up, so I'll give him the floor. He can unmute and um, make himself appear. Hi, John. Top of John's head. Yeah. Um, I'll start my video here. here we go. There he is. Yeah, great. Yeah, first of all, uh, I really enjoyed your presentation. I think there's some uh, so many so valuable insights and. Um, uh, perhaps especially, uh, I mean, we, we all know that uh, historically, as more recently, uh, the role of the spouse of a minister is not always an easy one, mm. but to have sort of this kind of direct evidence from the 19th century of somebody who is you know, very uh, uh, frankly describing some of the difficulties that they encounter, and, and that's really, really uh, important. Um, and uh, and also uh, just the the kind of contentions that come within the family from uh, from these uh, uh, these relationships and marriages is really revealing as well. I, I have two questions, um, quite quite different, but maybe I'll, I'll ask them both at the same time. Um, <clears throat> I was wondering about um, Thomas Wooten. I mean, he, he seems to be a fairly obscure figure in some ways, and there may be very little evidence about him. But what I, what I was interested in was, what, what was his background? Um, I mean, it's um, in the earlier part of the 19th century, we see a number of these uh, 
uh, Methodist clergy coming from England for the most part, a few from Scotland, but mainly from England. And, uh, you know, they, they are, uh, you know, not sort of probably not even middle class people uh, with uh, not a great deal of formal education. Whereas later in the 19th century, as, as you're well aware, uh, you know, the, the profile is much more sort of the, the Mount Allison educated kind of, uh, uh, kind of minister. But I wonder if, if Thomas Wharton might be sort of a late example of the first kind, and perhaps of that might have contributed uh, something to the tension that the family experienced. Okay. My, my other question probably has to do more with Mary than with Jenny, because sadly Jenny's life uh, ended early. Um, but uh, any evidence in the letters of uh, the social gospel? I mean, we're right in the era when the temperance movement, which you mentioned, is kind of evolving into prohibitionism. And there are other forms of reform that are uh, becoming stronger and stronger. Any evidence in Mary's correspondence, or even in Jenny's earlier on, or in, in her early life, of, of that kind of orientation? Or are they more uh, the kind of, um, again, kind of Methodists who, who are still very numerous, uh, who uh, are much more interested in sort of individual conversion. Um, about Thomas Morton, I'll start with him. Um, he's very much of an, an, an enigma to me at the moment. Uh, my friend Barb Thompson, um, I have task it, tasked her with trying to find his genealogy over in England. And she's told me that she has found the family. Supposedly his father was a merchant. Uh, he had a number of brothers and sisters. Uh, I don't know his date of death at the time. He was supposedly born in 1860. Um, it's interesting that later on, Thomas Wooten, uh, he becomes estranged, seems to be to his, his second family, his siblings, even his mother. And his family writes to Minuti, not only his, his second wife, but his family, asking them if they know his whereabouts. So, and this was in the early 1900s, um, even down into the, the teens. Um, so they seemed not to have even been aware if he was even in the country, even in England or not. And for a number of years, one of uh, Thomas's sisters wrote to Jenny during the teens and the 1920s. And um, she had sons who went off, not Jenny, not little Jenny, but um, the sister had sons that went off to war. And Jenny starts um, writing to her cousins. So right now, I kind of know more about that, the family, later than earlier. And they seem to be, as you said, like a working class, um, uh, very, um, you know, they, uh, she wrote a good letter. As, all, as the Siemens did, they wrote a good letter. She was very articulate. Her spelling was excellent, that type of thing. Uh, but uh, Thomas is an enigma to me at the moment. But um, as you say, I, I would suspect that he is in that first group that you talked about. Uh, uh, men who came out to Canada who were interested in the church, but maybe not particularly educated. And I do have a letter um, from uh, a letter to Thomas from a Reverend Evans in Guysborough County. And supposedly it looks like Thomas had written to him and Thomas was trying to get into uh, the, the theology uh, department faculty over at Mount A. And Evans was telling him, uh, look, you have to do your, your, you have to do a year through the conference and before you can be accepted by the conference, and then you probably will be allowed to go to Mount A. But I don't think he ever went to Mount A. But I don't know that yet. But that's, um, thank you for that. That's very interesting what you're saying about him. And uh, so I'll keep that in mind. Um, but Barb did tell me that she's tracked down his family. So maybe we'll have more information, I hope. And Mary, 
there was uh, with Mary and Jenny's letters and even the rest of the family, there was, n except for Frances, the mother, at times Frances would write to her sons, uh, Frank and William, talking about the evils of drink, the evils of smoking. Um, but it wasn't so much that it was kind of a morally uh, bad thing to do. It was like they, if they did these things, they wouldn't be successful. They would, you know, become destitute or become reprobates. Um, Mary and Jenny, so far, they haven't really, I like, talked about, you know, the evils of whatever. Jenny's letter that talks a bit about um, everything people that go to the, the Monday classes had to give up the cards and the dancing and this and that and the other thing, that almost seemed as if it was kind of a joke in a way. She was kind of lighthearted about that. I could be wrong, but they certainly weren't, um, they certainly weren't to my mind, very straight laced or very, um, you know, worried about uh, uh, their mortal souls type thing. Mm -hmm. I don't really see them Mary and Jenny has particularly very pious or devout women. Now, uh, Dr. Hannah Lane and Dr. Uh, Marilyn Whiteley talk a lot, write a lot about women who are members of the sewing circle, uh, were giving themselves to God, were preachers. You know, in the Methodist church, women were able to speak. Um, I don't see Mary and Jenny, especially Mary, as that type. Uh, Mary seemed to. Uh, Mary seemed to see all of this stuff as a burden, to my mind. The callers, the visiting, oh, I guess the Methodists will all have to go, that type of thing. She was all, yeah. This is how I, this is the feeling I get so far. Yeah, it's very interesting because, um, I mean, I suppose they're just a little bit on the, uh, the early side or the young side for the, you know, the passionate young prohibitionist reformer that you get, say, at Mount Allison in the right at the turn of the century kind of yeah. year. Yeah. Thank you very much. That's fascinating. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you. Interesting. Thanks, John. Thanks, Laurie. Uh, up next, we have a question from Anne-Marie Lane Jonah. Oh, OK. There she is. Hi, Anne-Marie. Have I appeared? <laughs> Hi. Um, thank you so much, Lori. That was so interesting. Um, thank you. I really, um, just like there are many things I wonder about. It's one of those things when you get a glimpse at people like this, you're just left with so many questions. But yes. I was struck by your favorite quote um, <laughs> from Thomas of you should read more and work less. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> love marvelous it. Husband. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. But uh, I, I find that, you know, even as you were discussing with John a bit there, I, I was curious, um, I thought it was an interesting thing to say. I mean, his expression of upset at her doing physical labor, and there's sort of the class side of how he felt she should be behaving. But I, I was just, I was a bit curious, um, given the time period, um, that apparently he assumed that she would read if she had leisure, and I was wondering if there was anything in the letters that gave a sense of what um, what preferred reading was. Was he just implying Bible reading or or were there other things? Was there any talk between Jenny and Mary, perhaps, or with them and their mother about things that they read, given that they were educated young women? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, the Siemens as a whole, the whole family were great readers. Uh, King Seaman and Gilbert Seaman after him had extensive libraries. A lot of the letters between the brothers and sisters and their friends, they talk about what they're reading. Uh, they read a lot of novels. Uh, they read a lot of biographies. Um, they didn't seem, there wasn't a lot of a mention of particularly religious tracts or text, but Gilbert Seaman's library was full of these things. Uh, Thomas, I would suspect, uh, was asking um, Jenny to read more uh, religious works. I could be wrong, uh, but she, Jenny was a, a great reader of uh, many, uh, many, a lot of subject matter. 
Uh, but him in particular, because there's another letter he writes to Jenny about dancing. And he says, I will never ask you to stop dancing. But it's kind of, it's bothering him. Uh, so I would assume uh, for his part that he's uh, saying to her, you know, maybe read more religious works, read the Bible, that type of thing. Interesting. That is so interesting. I'd be so interested in, in that range of reading that, um, that the sisters and the family engaged in. But uh, yeah. uh, really, you open the door to like an, an interesting family life. Yes, I, um, I just, it's a gold mine. It's a total gold mine, these letters. Um, and just getting back to reading material for a minute, uh, and maybe Mr. Mr. Reed would know this, in um, letters that written both by Jenny and by Mary, they mention a book called Diary of a Minister's Wife. And I, I think it might be a novel, and I don't know anything about it. And if anybody out there has heard Diary of a Minister's Wife, I would love to know. I think Hannah Lane uh, may know something about it. I'm going to get in touch with her. But Mary and Jenny both reference that they've read it. And Mary sends it from the United States to her mother to read. So I'd love to get my hands on a copy of that. I, I'm not familiar. That does sound really interesting. <laughs> That's great. Well, thank you so much, Lori. Thank you. Thanks, Anne-Marie. And Laurie, uh, we have a question uh, from Sarah Hollett. Okay, Sarah. Unmute herself and make herself visible. <laughs> Hi, I'm there not going to turn my camera on. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> um, I was just wondering at the beginning of the the presentation you had talked like really briefly you mentioned the um, other letters that had been found in the house and i was just curious i guess just because it seems strange like you said they go from the 1830s to 2012 so i was just wondering if there what else what other letters you found if there, i mean this is one section of letters but i was curious about what other letters were in these briefcases and bags. oh gee uh like well um the the majority of the letters, as I said, were written between in the 1870s to about the 1890s. Majority is written by Gilbert and Francis and their children. But um, the house was the Avis Thomas Seaman house was built in 1843. Gilbert and Francis move in in 1877. But there's letters in the house from the 1830s. So somebody brought those letters into the house. And there's letters. Um, uh, Gilbert had a brother called William, and William was uh, the sec the personal secretary for Charles Tupper when he was the provincial secretary of Nova Scotia. And there's a whole lot of letters written to William from people in Nova Scotia asking for favors of Sir Charles Tupper. And there's a lot of letters, um, and Charles Tupper was a conservative. The, um, it's interesting that Gilbert Seaman is a conservative, but I've read something in Brian Cutherson's book on elections that tells me that Amos King Seaman was of the liberal persuasion, the grit persuasion. So I'm not sure what was going on there. A whole lot of letters about politics a whole lot of letters uh, about life at Mount Allison University, a whole lot of letters from Frank in Boston Law School, a whole lot of letters about uh, the Grindstone Company and about uh, the Siemens uh, business empire. Uh, a lot of letters, uh, per there's a lot of love letters, uh, letters from the extended family, from friends, um, Gee, there's, you name a subject and there's letters. It's, it's just amazing. And like I said, there's approximately 4,000, I would say. And at wow. the moment, I've transcribed just shy of 2,800. So what's, I can't do the math. How much does that, more does that leave us? Quite a few, uh, but yeah, it's, it's amazing. They talk about um, how the lower cove quarries worked. 
uh, putting cattle on the big marsh in Minuti. Uh, there's a lot of genealogy in there. Yeah. It's amazing. Great. Sounds just fast. I don't look now, Sarah. There you are alive. Do you want to follow up? <laughs> no, it's okay. My cats were like lying all over me trying to fight. Yeah, we want to see the cats. I want to see the cats. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, they're now. <laughs> now, getting back to business, we do have a question from John McLeod. Uh, oh. John, would you like to Hi, uh, unmute yourself and ask it? Hi, John. Hi, how are you? Good. I'm fine, John. Um, what I was wondering is, um, Minuti is in some ways a traditionally French community. Um, does that get picked up in the letters? Do Acadians ever get mentioned? Uh, is there they any do. other French continued in the community? Mm -hmm. They do get mentioned. Uh, so far, they are mentioned usually as um, their workers in the community. Uh, there's a Dennis Arsenault that works for Gilbert Seaman as a hired hand. Uh, they're mentioned uh, throughout their neighbors uh, of the Siemens and um, like any gossip that's going around that type of thing. They don't seem to have been peers of the Siemens. Uh, they don't seem to have written letters to the Siemens and vice versa, uh, except maybe in a business sense that um, one of them was hired to do something and there was a problem or whatever. So you can see that there's a class, there seems to be a class there. Uh, the Siemens were not, um, they were not friends of the Siemens. They worked for the Siemens, they were semen tenants. Um, they were of interest to the Siemens as far as uh, maybe gossip was concerned, but they're certainly mentioned, they're certainly there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, thanks, John. Great, thanks. Now I get to ask my question. So you may have a whole chapter on this, but <laughs> um, I think for this chapter, you really might need to have something about this in, as context. And that is parties, social life. Uh, you know, what kind of options did these women have? I mean, when you first described the traveling ministers coming through, I thought, Oh, you know, the family must have been, you know, just licking their lips at these eligible young men. And then I find out that they're actually not at all desirable. Uh, yeah. Potential husbands. And surely the parents must have been taking them on a jaunt to Halifax or that you talked about letters about life at Mount A, that, you know, there were social events that were respectable, but not completely unorganized or open. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anything that surprised you in your in the kind of marriage market institutions that these young ladies operated in, but I'm curious if it's mm -hmm. you know sort of normally expect uh, uh, larger, smaller, uh, more informal. Why did they end up with these parson poor parson losers? Sorry. <laughs> Well, I think it, uh, why, I'll start at the, the end there. I think why they ended up with some of these ministers is that the ministers were staying at um, the Siemens house for starters. So they kind of really got to know them maybe in, you know, familiarity breeds contempt. They really got to know them in a, in a way different from men that maybe they were um, getting introduced at parties. Um, one thing about the letters, they talk about uh, entertainment and parties and lectures and school concerts and church concerts constantly. And uh, this area, River Hibber today, well, with COVID, but still is a sleepy little place, but it was hopping back in the day. And uh, there was always something going on. Uh, families gave parties. And again, this is where kind of the class aspect turns up is the Siemens were invited to parties and giving parties just to a certain number of people and getting invited to these dances. There was house dances, there was picnics, uh, concerts, all that type of thing. And, um, 
And the ministers, I'm assuming, went to some of these things. Um, I don't remember a letter in particular that that um, mentions that, but I certainly assume that. And there were, I think, for these young women, lots of opportunities to meet people. And they did, they, you're right, they did do a fair bit of traveling. There was a lot of interaction travel uh, between this area and Halifax and St. John. And a lot of business transactions going on, a lot of people moving into the community all the time. Uh, so there would have been a number of ways for young unmarried people to meet. And yes, that is a chapter, entertainment and parties. Good. Uh, uh, I see DWS, which is, I bet, David States. Yes. Hi. Good. I saw you I unmuted yourself, and I was going to ask uh, whether you wanted to weigh in. Yes. I, I was just wondering, uh, the Bowles family lived in River Hibbert. So I was just wondering, was there any mention of any people of African descent in any of the letters? Because there were a few Black families in that era. Area, like uh, not that I have seen so far. I have not come across that. Now, Mary, when she goes to South Carolina, she writes about uh, Black people in the States, people that she's met in the States. But so far in the letters that originated in this area, no. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> You could keep a uh, look out for the Bowles family for me anyway. Oh, definitely. I remember a Mr. Bowles who used to have a gas station in River Hibbert when That's I was a little family. child. That's yeah. Family. Yeah. I remember him. Thank you. Yeah. You're, thank you. Okay. Um, is there anyone else? We've, we've worked Lori fairly hard tonight. Uh, we have her email. We uh, want to uh, raise additional uh, questions, but if there's anyone else who'd like to raise one now. Hearing none, uh, I it follows me to uh, both now remind people of the next lecture, uh, which is uh, on, um, uh, excuse me, May 19th, December 19th. <laughs> what year are we? Yeah. September 19th, uh, Fua Cooper, uh, Black Refugees, and Lord Dalhousie, a story in seven letters. And as Lois uh, uh, said earlier, the, that'll be followed by the an annual general meeting. So uh, please join me either with your hand symbols or unmute and applaud or in some other way acknowledge our appreciation for mm -hmm. Lori's uh, presentation. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you too, Laurie. That was a, a very stimulating presentation. Thank we you. will look forward to the book. And those of you who are in the audience will look forward to seeing you and hearing you next month. So thank you very much, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Loved it. Thank you.